Material possessions for which there is no completely acceptable substitute. Okay, we're going to uh, cover the subjects that you see here. Thought to be something that uh, attracts uh, attracts your eye. The speedometer is driven off of two gears in the transmission. The blue one is called the drive gear, and the other one is called the driven gear, but mistakenly called the drive gear sometimes. These are calculated for the axle ratio and tire size for this white gear to spin a thousand times in a mile, or as I've calculated it down to 63 inches. Uh, per, you know, that's a thousandth of a mile, 63 point something inches. And uh, what you can do is uh, put a gear on your cable and on your garage floor you want to push the car to take all the slack out of the gears. Then you make a mark and make another mark about 63 and a quarter inches down. And on your cable, you could put a gear, if your speedometer's out, and put a big old clock hand. And when you push that car that distance, that hand should go around once. And a little bit off is really too much. 5% is even not good. And you check this by the odometer accuracy. If you live in a state where you have mile markers, um, you want to show 10 miles and 10 miles. You don't want to show 9 or 11. You want to go a straight distance. Don't stop for the peanut brittle or something. Just want to go exactly straight. And like at 100 miles, you want to show like 98 to 102 is what's considered acceptable. You're allowed 2% uh, above or below perfect for tire wear and slippage. That's the manufacturer's. Uh, this would be the front wheel drive version. Uh, all the gears live under this little mushroom here. If you have the sleeve number 12 in plastic, get rid of it, get a metal one, and replace both of those gears. That would be typical of uh, El Dorados and uh, Seville's that do the front wheel drive. Um, the cable, you want to look at the end and make sure it doesn't have any uh, wear like this. A lot of times the gear is not square completely. It's only square partially. And um, so that's an idea of the wear. Of course, blown up really huge to get the idea. This is the uh, end with the nut there. Uh, finger tight is good. Kind of avoid getting the pliers on it. You can put it on the transmission with your fingers and then give it that last little snug. But when you grab for the pliers first, you're uh, liable to cross foot it and then you've ruined it. Okay, this is the internal parts of the speedometer. Part number one is what people commonly call the needle. That is called a pointer. Speedometers have pointers. Sewing machines have needles. And the magnet, number 14, it spins and it attracts part number 13 there, which moves the pointer up. And when they get worn out, those two pieces, 13 and 14, when they start to hit each other, that's when the ugliness occurs. Also, the magnet in the casting here, um, on a cold morning, makes that horrendous sound, you can't even hear the radio, and it just pegs out, uh, that's a cry for help. And you can do one of two things. You can hit the brakes and unhook it, or just keep driving it and hope it'll get better later. It just, the, just usually makes the pointer just go, <laughs> flies off the dial. Of course, you have the gears, 17 and 19, which run the mileage. Mileage is a not variable, speed is a variable. You must get the mileage right before you worry about the speed. And people keep saying, well, it shows this when I, I say mileage. I gotta know the mileage. Well, I didn't check that. Well, you need to check that because 
These are like computers. If you give them 97 volts instead of 120, you're going to get some really bad answers. Here's a close-up of some of the uh, parts. This uh, magnet that spins, I wish I had my pointer, uh, that has a little bit of lubrication that you hope is going to last several decades. And then the speed cup, well, there's an arrow on that thing. I wonder if that's safe to point out. Okay. The speed cup here, in the magnet is one drop of oil. And the speed cup shaft, you can't see, but it goes through the other side. And it goes in that one drop of oil in that jewel. It's very important. Um, Ford in the 1980s neglected that drop of oil. Oh, that was good for business. Just like clock oil. Okay, speedometers hate three things, wear, cold, and graphite. Right now as we speak, someone's smearing that graphite because grandpa told the son, son tells the boy, and it's just passed down. It's like liquid sand. It'd be like adding a quart of sand to your oil in your engine. And it just eats them up, especially the General Motors speedometers, 1961 and older. Cold they don't like because the grease is all hard. And that's when you get that horrible sound. And of course, where it would be like grabbing your crankshaft and having about a quarter of inch play. Well, that's the, uh, that's the uh, one thousandth of a mile. Um, I sit there trying to compute this out in my brain. It kind of drives my wife crazy, but um, you know, I ask her how far from one street to the next, and it's 2,640 feet, but she doesn't like that. <laughs> then I tell her that it's uh, 63,260 inches in a mile, but she seems to forget that. <clears throat> so this is where you make that pointer I was talking about on your cable and push the 63 inches. And, you know, if you even come up to 75%, you're, you're way off. So if it went around three-fourths of the way, you're 25% short. So if your speedometer is calibrated perfectly, it's going to say 45 when you're going 60. Then you add the fudge factor. That's when you think, ah, put it on about 67, and you're going to get caught. Uh, this is a fuel gauge. There's two coils in there. There's the F coil, and then there's the evil coil. Now, the evil coil is always trying to pull it toward the E. And the other coil is pulling it toward the full. Now, if you lose your connection to the tank, then the evil coil is no longer functional, and the pointer will sit past full. I mean, way past full. So that's the first question I ask people, is it sit past full, is it stuck on, if it's stuck on E all day long, then somewhere they've, they've pinched the wire probably and it's uh, uh, grounding the wire to the tank or uh, the float has sunk. And this metal has to be grounded to the cluster and the cluster has to be grounded to the car. These are held together by a rivet right here and those rivets like to bust. So I use a, a nut and screw when I get done and it's not coming apart again. Um, this is the fuel sender, which supplies the negative to the evil coil. Uh, people say, well, I got fire here with my test light. Well, it's not, it's just this negative. If you supply positive to that fuel sender, you will cook it. I mean, just, it's ruined. Um, each of these works by ground, so, you know, you don't want to use a bunch of thread tape or stuff on the threads here um, because they have to ground to the block. This has to, the fuel center has to ground to the tank, tank has to be grounded to the car, and you got a lot of rubber going on there. Uh, temperature sender, never flick your VIC or test it with a match because you will ruin it because an open fire is twice as hot as the hot water in your engine. This is a prototype Autronic I box where they bothered to paint red on it. Of course, you never see one like that <coughs> on your car. But the, uh, where I worked, we came across a bunch of prototype <coughs> stuff that uh, was just kind of being discarded, and this was among it. This is the ad for the 
59 dimmer showing you how you can turn a knob to adjust the sensitivity. That's new for 59. The reason the eyeball is so fat at the back is it's a photo tube set sideways. And then the light comes in the lens through an aperture and then a amber lens and hits that photo tube. They made their own socket, however, too. You know, it's not like a, a, a socket on a radio. It, it's uh, helped to compact it. Then there's a warning in there about the voltage. It's over a thousand volts. And working on a, a car a couple of years ago, I pressed the foot switch with my finger instead of my foot. It'll set you free. <laughs> um, the reason it's the same as the radio, it's easier to step up AC than it is DC. So it, uh, the vibrator makes it AC, goes to the transformer up to 1,000 volts, and then it goes through a rectifier to bring it back to uh, DC. Another ad showing you the dimmer. This is a handout that the dealer would have had to try to get you to buy the product. And this is the stuff in it. Showing you all the components like that means a lot to you. Here's the eyeball. And the first eyeball, the, um, the lens is square. There's also a number on the bottom of it that you can look at that will tell you what car division it was made for and the year. So if it said like 559, that's a 59 Cadillac. The first digit being the car line and the next two digits the year. Another handout. A lot of people bought it, I think, just to say they got all this stuff. But then a lot of this stuff is in groups. Does anybody know what a group is? You know, we'll give you license frames and door edge guards and fog lights and give you a little bit of a special price. Now in 59, if you had a car that was a B5, like a sedan to build a B5, you had everything including three uses. <clears throat> this was a bad thing. The um, R&D people have to get paid, so they have to do something, you know. So in 1960, they invented the safety salute, where all four headlights go dimmer before they all four, before they change to low beam. They discontinued that just after that one year. In 1960, the name went to Guide Mag, and they invented a new photo tube where instead of the side of the tube, it's the end of the tube that sees the light, and that made them able to make it smaller. And you'll see these on people's dashboard looking up at the trees. You need to put an Allen wrench in the Allen screw in the back. And then give it about a three-fourths of a turn clockwise and that brings him back down. That metal actually bends over the years because that tight spring. And that will bring it back down correctly. <laughs> this is a prototype among the, the stuff that this is, ex you, the photograph didn't catch it, but it has an experimental number on it, meaning we're, we're trying to, uh, among this junk was a, a limousine rear control for the automatic air conditioner where they actually put the words, typed them on paper and taped them on it. There's the, uh, novel. this is the wiring diagram. Um, this is the uh, uh, foot switch that'll give you that jolt. <coughs> This is 56 to 58, where the terminals are still on the outside of the car. And the battery power, you would suspect to be the middle one, but it's actually that <coughs> long one, and it says BAT on it. The red wire is the flash feature. If it's on automatic, and it's on low beam, and you want to flash somebody or make it stay on high, you press it down halfway, and that red wire is grounded, and it goes back to high beam. 
So in my car, when I know that neighbor's porch light's going to put it on low, I just hold that halfway down, and it stays on high. So then when you, when you crunch it one more time, that's called hold. You use that when you follow in the cop car, and it keeps making sure that it stays on low beam. And even with the instruction sheet that comes with these, it's confusing to understand how it works. But when you push it all the way down and you see the high beam light come on, you're in the automatic mode. And if you have a black sweatshirt over it or you happen to be in a coal mine, it will stay on high. Otherwise, when it sees the light, it's going to go to low. But now you're in the automatic mode where you have the possibility of high beam. Or as you crunch it one more time, it's going to be on hold. <coughs> this is the uh, T3 headlamp. And you see the aiming. As far as I'm concerned, the T3 means tits 3, which is the aiming tits there. I just made that bigger. I don't know how I did that. Um, and on the originals, they're, pres they're made too long, and then they're ground on a glass grinder. So you'll see that they are um, ground down so they match the aiming device perfectly. This is what's inside. The filament for low beam is off to the side of perfectly centered. And what that does is when it hits that mirror, it's, it's covered by that cap. So you see, being on the left and up means that when the light comes off the reflector, which it must, that puts the light to the right and below, lower. Opposite, you see. That's low beam. High beam, it comes off the reflector, but it's in the very center, and it's also able to come through this little slot. So you're getting all of it off the reflector plus that filament. And then at the same time, if you have a, a 58 or newer, you have the inboard lamps also. This is the inside of a 55 fog light. The large bulb with the cap is the fog and signal. And the little bulb is the parking light. The cap makes 100% of the output of the bulb come off the reflector, which is the only way you can aim the beam. Next time you're in the dentist chair, you'll see his light is identical to this, where the bulb, all the lights come off the reflector so he can aim it straight into your mouth. These are the fog light switches which requires a knob with a longer shaft because of the switch. And then in, uh, starting with 59, they put it in one cute little plug. And the 59, 60, 61 has the purple wire from here out to the front where the radiator is. And then in 62, the last year you get fog lights, they saved a nickel by not putting the wire in the car. So you have to either fabricate it or get off the 61. This, this plug um, is on all 59 to 62s. So if you don't have fogs, it has this jumper in it so the parking lights will work. This is the rear of a uh, 62 fog light. The purple's the fog, the white's the parking, the blue is the signal. And um, that big bolt does three things. It holds it together, and it aims it because it moves the reflector, and it also serves as a ground, which is important. Uh, if you have a 50s uh, Cadillac with fogs and they aren't grounded right, instead of that one green arrow going blink, 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 both green arrows will go blip, 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 blip. And also, the green arrows, uh, this guy I did a whole speedometer for him on a 58, he said, well, the, the green arrows aren't working. And I said, you have to have the lights in the front bumper there. And of course, the front bumper and the lights are over in another room. I said, well, that's going to be a problem. 
Corning lights invented in 62, which now you can get them on a Toyota or a Subaru or whatever. It's kind of degrading. But anyway, 50 years ago, you know, we had Corning lights. Um, when the parking lights are on, it shoots a beam out when you make that turn. 56 with fog lights. If you don't have fogs, you just have those little round pointed dudes. So that's how nice that looks. 57 with fogs has got uh, glass concave lenses. It's the only year that uses four fog bulbs. The outers are signal parking. The inners are fog and parking. So in the parking mode, all four are dim. In the fog mode, the inner two are brilliant. And that's that little tab under your headlights. It's got four screws. Originally, these had a gray gasket that went between the, the assembly and the bumper. <coughs> they rot and fall to pieces. This is the 62 fog, like the 61. It has a chrome bullet in the middle, so the bulb doesn't have a cap on it. The, the cap is actually screwed to the lens. And of course, that's the corning light. And then if you live in a state that didn't have front license plates, you've got this beautiful filler. Some people with 59 to 62s, they put the plate out past the bumper. It's supposed to be framed within the bumper. There's a coin light, 62. This is the light that lights up um, red at night, brighter when you hit the brakes. And when you put it in reverse, it magically turns white. There's actually a piece of red glass in there that makes it light up red. Then there's a thin light. 63 is the only year the thin light is not a brake light also. It's just a tail light. Oh, uh, if you own a 62, if you take the chrome off and the lens won't come off, people <laughs> figure that rim has to come off and they attack it with every tool they have. It's just that the lens is stuck to the gasket. So you just grab that reflector, shake and pull for all your work, and it'll finally come loose. There's a 62's being built. Of course, there's no chrome on the fin of a 62, so this critter is a Series 75, which uses the taillight lens of a 60. And, and there's like four or five different occasions where the Series 75 uses previous taillights. No fog lights available because in our ever-ending challenge to keep up with our friends across the ocean, we went to the orange parking lights and that killed the fogs. All fogs from 41 to 62 are clear except 41s are amber. And there's independent companies that made ones that will fit 41s also. This is the knob that turned off the air conditioner in 60. However, this was a prototype, which you can see they did not use. This is a round voltage regulator. And the horn relay was made within it. And all you got to do is twist it and pop the top off and kind of cool. This is a 1958 digital clock. It's got the uh, solenoids in it from the radio to rewind it. And the digits probably came off one of those little television clocks that you had in the 50s that sat on top of the TV. And, and, uh, and then to set it, the set knob is shaped like a Christmas tree so that you have to push and turn it to set the time. And then where the regular reset knob goes is a blank filler. This is a one of a kind. This is, this is it. There's no more of them out. This is a 1957 wiper control converted to electric because they knew in 59 they were going to go electric and give Mr. Trico the slip. So they've taken this 57 and created it into electric. Uh, the worst thing you can do to a car clock is let the battery go low because it fries the electrical part of it. So if you have a 60, 73 or older, if if you're not driving on a regular basis, you want to unhook the battery, unhook the fuse, unhook something. And they should be clean and lubed every year. It's just a few years like your uh, shop manual says. Um, 
61 to 64. You just put your, your thumb where that white arrow is and grab the edge and it just turns and pops right out. 60 and 59 come out from the front. 59 has a wing nut and a bracket, but 50 to 60 doesn't. It's just get them to clear the dashboard padding. That's the fun part. This is the washer used late 50 to 53. Just has one vacuum nipple and one water output. I fixed these, so that's why he's picturing it. 54 to two thirds of 55 and electrically does it. And the little black thing there um, turns on the wipers when the water's coming out, but it stops nice and early so that water dribble will just you know, come down the middle later. 56 to 58, this one keeps the wipers going a little longer after the water stops. And that little gizmo is the vacuum servo that does that. This is the 5962 wiper. It's a three speed, it's a two speed motor, but Cadillac adds a resistor to the switch to make it a three speed. So you can see you're better than a Buick, you see? Um, these have particular problems. They, they will, you turn them on, nothing happens. Then later they come on, and then you want to stop them, and they won't stop. And people like to keep throwing parts at it, and I just say, just send it to me, I'll fix it. Because when I fix it, then I uh, make it look pretty, and, uh, and I tell them not to rip this ground strap off, and uh, I make it squirt the water again, and uh, clean it all up. Make sure you leave the crank arm on it. One guy took the crank arm off, and when they put it back on, they jammed it, and they took the juice to it, and it, they burned it up so bad, I had to keep it in a bag because the smell was so awful. And it still stuck up the place. Okay, this is about the gold package myth. There, there was no gold package on these cars. Blasphemy. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, gold package relates to 80s and 90s cars where they took chrome pieces and made them gold. But these cars, you know, every 52 to 58 has got the gold on it, except that 57 ain't chrome. Okay, people call this parade boot. Cadillac never called it a parade boot, and they didn't mean for you to sit on it. But some old man made up that term, and it has stuck, because it sounds cool. This is the correct white wall tire they came up with in 62. So gangsters are wrong for 62. And then also the uh, Bromes had these in 57, 8, 59, 60. This is the correct white wall for 57 to 61. It's two and a quarter. And it has those beautiful scallops on the edge. Um, Bias tires look cool, but if you're like me, you're late for every club meeting. You got to get on the road to start hauling. So I've had to go to them uh, fancy radio tires you've heard about. Um, I use Diamondback tire because I don't like that other people, and uh, they they will bond that white wall on there for you. And I've had pretty bad luck with the other people, and I've heard a lot of other people had bad luck to the. Uh, Balancing the, the balancing and all that. And you know what that tire is? It's a yellow one. US, US, US rock. That's who made that tire. And that be of Goodrich Silver Town. I like that captain here. Keep me good. Oh, that's wrong. On Brown, that should be that thin white wall. But it's part of old man syndrome. You uh, get the wide white walls, the wire wheels, you get the gold chain, you get the uh, white tie, the white belt, and the white shoes, and it's a full thing. You know. hey. Gold sabers only offered on a 56, and the old guys will say, well, you can get them. Well, I can get a 39 Pontiac hood on it and put it on my car, too. Um, you know, if you put 55 sixes on 57 eights, the front wheels don't turn, which is kind of an undesirable trait in a car. 
Then you got to put the spacers, and then then they don't. Uh, you know, the lugs come up short. Uh, don't forget the lug nuts, 52 to 59, on the left side of the car, turn backwards. They come off easier if you're turning the correct way. Look for L on the end of the lug. That doesn't mean Larry, that means left hand thread. Just like the old Chrysler. Um, the, I figured they discontinued these because I did read where people were going at the white walls with such caustic cleaning materials that it didn't, didn't affect it. That's a uh, green 56 Eldorado convertible. This guy had one in uh, California that I saw. And on the dashboard, it had the woman's name and a little plaque. And he's driving along, and the plaque and a little insert falls on the floor. And he looks at the back of it, and it says, One millionth Cadillac. And the house it was in was on fire, and little fireballs were dropping in the seats, so it had like these enormous little burdens. This is a body tag. <laughs> you can see that the deceased was a 57 Fleetwood 60 special. So, uh, his paint was 3034, which would be. Uh, kind of uh, two-tone green. But he sure had the accessories. Check it out. Um, any accessory that can be easily added by the dealer is not on that list. So you'll have the tinting glass, the air conditioning, the heater until it was made standard in 62, the six-way seats on there, the K is air conditioning, the tinted glass is E. Then you get into your codes for power, for door lock. Now, if your car, if power windows were optional on your car, like 662, then you'd have X for power windows. And they put the X on the body style starting in 48 because there was so much plumbing that kind of let them know. And they continued that through 58. And then they put that in 59. Um, I have a warranty card from a man's car that he's still alive. It's a 69 Fleetwood. He must be well up in his 80s. Uh, and he's got all these letters and numbers at the bottom of the plastic card that are pretty much decoded to tell the dealer all the options that he has. This is a family lulled into a false sense of security because they have purchased a competitor's product that will not, in the end, give them the satisfaction, the quality, and the continued service that they should expect from a fine, quality motor car. Can anybody tell me what they're riding in? You go. You're close. Are you? Yes. What year? 57 or 58? 58. Well, the 58 has got a better turn signal switch than 57. So. <laughs> and you're guaranteed to get four headlights in 58. <clears throat> what Oswald, anybody know what Oswald, Ozzy Nelson's occupation was? He was a band leader. Band leader. And she sings real, Harriet sings really good. Harriet cool. Hillier. Yeah, Harriet Hillier, but her real name was Peggy C. Snyder. <laughs> and uh, that's just kind of the end right there. That's it. Now, first, I'm uh, open to questions. I have one. So yes. It's not a question, but a comment. You know, on the automatic eye? Yes. The, uh, uh, like yes. I saw them. I, I didn't even know they had them on the Chevrolet to speak oh. of, but I saw, them, I saw one on the 54 of the Chevrolet. And the 54 Chevrolet is loaded with that. Yeah. Those were in swap meets like crazy in the 80s because General Motors forced every Chevy dealership to buy every accessory and they sat on the shelf because nobody wanted it, 53 4. And then they started showing up in the swap meets, pretty prolific. Uh, that's a six bolt. Of course, the first Cadillac one in 52 is also a six bolt. And uh, 
Uh, hang on a second. Um, a couple weeks ago, I saw 61 of Pala, two door hard top, model 1837. Um, that's pretty much basic transportation. I mean, you might have the frivolity of power steering, maybe even power brakes. It had dynamic headlight dimmer, factory cruise, power windows, six-way seat, front nerf bar with the rubber bumpers, rear nerf bars, fuel door guard, door handle guards, trunk release. A and push button radio. All that on a, on a plane. And he had three deuces. But the cruise control sets up right on top of the engine where a 59 has an oil. So there's no way that you could have accommodated a 3-2 air cleaner. So he may have done that to the car because there's no way you get the air cleaner on there. Um, was three deuces available on a 348? Anyway, he had a little... He had the little separates. Go ahead. Uh, I have a 66 An M or a P? An M or a P? Has uh, it got a riding desk that flip down the back? Yes. Okay, that's a P. Fleetwood Brown. Okay. okay. Um, how do you change the tail light bulb without taking the bumper off? You What's take that? that black plastic off, get a stubby Phillips. Turn the screws counterclockwise, two or three turns. Grab the socket, turn it counterclockwise a fourth of a turn. Pull it out, put your new 1034 in there. Lubricate the rubber gasket. Stick it back in with the tabs up and down. Rotate clockwise till you're under the screws. Tighten the two screws. Are, are the are you supposed to buy special red light bulbs? Or? Oh, no. No, this, no it's, it's made red. That's the most complicated taillight they made. If you want to see how it's made, there's one out there on the swap meet table. That is a you bunch of... The grill, no. The black plastic between the bumper and the trunk lid. The filler. You open the trunk. And you'll see that black plastic. Okay, take that out. You need a stubby Phillips. The biggest, the biggest blade at Stubby Phillips you can find. Is the car here? No, oh, okay. Is the car gold with a black top? No, wow. it's dark gray with a black top and okay. red here. Oh, red. That's a gorgeous bright red. Okay, well that's how you do it. But you can get the backup from the bottom. But you, want, you can get the backup from the bottom. But you want to... Uh, lubricate that rubber seal so that the next time it comes out easier. And they recommended 1034s, not 1157s. Now in the backup bulb, I prefer a 1295 because it's 50 candle power instead of 32. And those, General Motors started using those in 71 on the corning lights. Now you know your corning light bulb is a big, huge mushroom looking thing. Well, it was the same candle power with a normal piece of glass on it. You pop that puppy right out. How many headlight bulbs are there? 1034s? 1034s? Ten seventy-threes. Okay. Unlike a 65 Oldsmobile 98, it's got 1034, 67, 1073. There's five in each one of those. And that's the old, that's the 98. I have a 6698. Okay. Well, you've got two 67s, two 1073s, and one 1034 on each side. And then the chrome will shrink and crack your red lens right in half. And that speedometer runs off the front wheel. Every time you make a turn or hit a bump, you're just doing this to it. So you unscrew the speedometer and take out. And that runs off the front wheel, so it's very sensitive to your tire size. Pull that cable out, lube it with, get, stuff, get the oiliest grease you can find. You know those cardboard tubes and you pop mm. the lid off as a puddle of oil? Just dip it into that puddle and put it in, then you got to get And that, that bearing cap that you have there, you know, you hit that bearing cap with a hammer just wrong and you, you've, you've, you've lost the whole deal because that bearing cap has that drive in the middle of it. 
I used to custom make those cable and housings, but it took a little work to make them work. It took some extra pieces we had to fabricate. Is that car got a cruise? Oh, boy. <laughs> so I can write up to the cruise. Now, that, that cruise is very tough on lower cables, so when you first pull away from the curb, it'll go, okay, so you need to replace the lower cable. You need to have that cable fabricated exactly like original, and then looped up good and put in there because the weights in that cruise are real tough on it. Have you got a speed warning? Uh, little know. yellow, little yellow hand? Uh, okay. Power windows and dents? Everything. Oh. And maybe you know something about heated seats? AMF and heated seat. Well, heated seats is on a Cadillac. Uh, yeah, they, uh, yeah, that's, it's, uh, it's made so when the car gets hot that the seat will stop. It was such a, you know, you start at one end and wait, work your way through. I, on my everyday car, the pads went bad in the seat, and there, there's three in series. And so I took the bad one and went around it, so it went just through the two good ones, and that lasted about a month. They wanted $600 for a new seat cushion with that. And I said no, and then I decided later I kind of liked it, and they said not available. Bought one out of a catalog for 25 bucks, and it just, it's like a lobster in the pot. I don't know I'm being cooked to death till it's too late. <laughs> but you, your, your shop manual, and I see you need the serviceman bulletins, because all the mistakes and corrections are the serviceman bulletins. And they'll tell you, well, in the shop manual we told you this, but now we've changed our mind. The cow lights, you said, are 1034? 1034, yeah, they, they, uh, they didn't like what the 1157s did to the turn signal flashers. So, anyway. Then your backups are 1073, but like I said, I prefer that 1295 if you can find it. Hey, Craig, you yes. can get them online. There's places that sell them. I deal with 63, 64 Cadillac parts, and they, uh, they, I, they actually came into cornering lights back to at least back to 63. Well, no, that's 11.95. But so it's 50 candle power. 11.95 is kept as 50 candle power, but that's that bull with the mushroom glass. Yeah, but I'm saying there's aftermarket 50 candle power. Oh. 11.95 that replaced them without that big bull. Oh. It's a smaller bull. Yeah, that's, but the 12.95, they started using those in the corner lights in 71. I just get a 12 box of 10. And, yeah. yeah. So my 58 Baritz, when I put a reverse, I've got 100. Of course, all that chrome on the lens is probably the tracks from that. But. Anybody else might have a question of the sort? Okay, well, they won't let me do this next year, so my thought is, uh, would you like styling 40 to 77, or would you like part numbers and parts books and the difference between the older parts books and the new parts books and how to find a, a part with a number that doesn't show up in the book, but how to pull it to figure it out. And which numbers were used by what uh, kind of objects? Which would that interest you? What would you like? Style? Okay. Yeah, that's what I would like. Where do you live? Kansas City. <laughs> On the Kansas side, not the misery side. <laughs> then when I say Kansas, they say, oh, Kansas City, Kansas? No, no, I'm just south of Kansas City, Kansas. Oh, do you want to bring the car by and get your light bulbs changed? <laughs> I've heard that before. Yeah. You've got a couple of neighbors together? Yeah. Two, two years ago, I took apart Doug Redmond's uh, 58 Seville. I had a, a cluster doing that, and the radio was out, and the clock, and all that. And I'm eating lunch with him, and, and it was like a, a week until the Nationals, and I said, are you worried about me getting this back together? He goes, I'm worried about something happening to you. <laughs> <laughs> I put the horn ring. The horn ring is held on by two hidden Allen screws, and I stuck that on the first day of the nap. You know, put that on. Just... But uh, wiring is my specialty. Electrical is my specialty. And I sell parts to people from McVeigh's. You're on vacation, is it? Santa Fe. 
My wife would love. Would you like to go there and hear? Sure. <laughs> All the heat without the humility. I didn't burn Carol Burnett. Eyes down. Some guy showed me a picture of a 61 Brits and said, oh, that was her car. I said, I'm going to check that out. Now, you know, when you say El Dorado, you don't have to say convertible. You can just say El Dorado. If it's a 53, 54, 55, or a 61 to 66. Then in 56, when they invented the coupe, then they gave it Brits and Seville. So you don't have to say coupe or convertible. You just say Seville or Brits. I mean, you have got it. The Nebrome was also, you know, 57 to 60. Is the but 57 eights are made in Detroit, not Italy. The other ones are made in Italy, and, and, they, and the, the parts are so unique, they stamp the number of the car on the back of them. Those cars have plywood. They had to put a screw in the vent with the motors so that when the vents opened, they didn't uh, scratch the dashboard. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the adjustment between your knob that works the Bowden cable. Yeah, I've done all that. You've done as much switch as you can. Do you think that, uh, is your mileage coming up optimistic? No. Really? No, I've uh, checked all that every calibrated speedometer. Are you going to have to... Uh, I mean, I, it just could be that the manual is optimistic or just... No, I think it should go higher than that. You just need to look in there and figure out, you know, what's, there's always a low speed cutoff. It always, if you exceed 72, it'll get the loading cutoff. Well, you're going to have to uh, figure out what's, you have to look in there and figure out what, because as the, as the speed increases, the magnets fly out and it pushes that little gizmo and you just got to figure out, uh, I hate to tell you to put a power drill on it of all awful things. I have been told that if, if you put a washer in there, that actually gives the spring more pressure, which is what pushes the, the resistance to the centrifugal force. Well, yeah, that spring, that could have gotten a washer in there that over gives time. more pressure internally, like the, internally, like the spring is pushing harder, and so it makes more pressure in order to get those, those little I wheel things out, and that will affect your speed. That will give you more speed. I haven't had to try that myself. I have a 61, but but that is I was told to do that in that instance. Crank the dial all the way. Just going fast. 